Reach Young Adult Ministry sermons online from Tuesday, January 7th, 2020 by Philip Jackson, pastor to young adults at Evergreen Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, entitled The Year of Transformation, from Romans 11, 33 through 12, 2. The, uh, I want you to turn over to Romans chapter 12, if you would. So, a little bit of context here about the book of Romans. Um, so, during the first century, their, uh, Christianity spread all over the Roman Empire, as you can imagine, and uh, it spread to Rome, the capital city. And so, this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians in Rome, but there's some context that you need to know. These aren't just people hanging out in the capital city. Um, in the first century, there was an emperor of Rome. His name was Nero. And Nero was a terrible person. He was a jerk. He was a sadist. He loved to make people hurt. Um, he was a sexual deviant. He was a terrible, terrible person. And, um, like, this is the kind of person he would be. He would take, uh, there were, the Jews were a natural part of the Roman Empire, and so they were a constituency to the emperor. So he, didn't, he couldn't just blame things on the Jews. Um, he couldn't do things to Romans because they were citizens. There, was, there were laws against that. But there was this new sect of people that nobody liked. They were called Christians. And so what was common is that Nero would take uh, Christians and he would impale them. He would take a, metal, uh, a wooden spike and he would stick them on it. And he would light them on fire to light his dinner parties in the palace. This is the type of person that we're dealing with. And so Nero loved himself, as you can imagine. And so he wanted to build a temple to himself in the capital city of Rome. But the problem is real estate is hard to come by in a capital city. And so what he did is he allegedly set fire to the city um, and he blamed it on the Christians. And he used the fire as an excuse to clear blocks and blocks of the city to build a temple to himself. So the Christians, after being uh, blamed for this, they were, they were persecuted and they were killed, all kinds of terrible things. Um, they fled. They fled Rome. And so for a season, they, they, they left and they waited for things to cool down. And so then they came back to Rome to reestablish their community. But when they came back, they realized that the people who had stayed behind... Um, had, had been disconnected themselves from the apostles and from the teachings of Jesus. And so there was no shepherd helping them to navigate life biblically. And so what they were doing is that they were living life with a pagan mindset, but calling it Christianity. And so Paul, hearing all these problems, he realized that uh, we've got trouble. We got big time trouble. And so he wrote a letter to the Roman church and he wrote it to two sects of people. He wrote it to the Hebrews, the Jews who were familiar with the old law. And then he wrote it also to the Gentiles who didn't have any real understanding or context of the traditions of Yahweh and what God had done through the promise of Abraham and through uh, his descendants and through David. And so the context of Romans chapter 12 is that Paul's going through and he is trying to explain to the Romans that, yes, God has fulfilled his promise that he gave Abraham by giving us Jesus, but it doesn't mean that God is done with the Hebrew people. And then he turns around and he talks to the Jews and he says that God is not done with you yet, but he also, in the fulfillment of Jesus, there's a promise that these Gentiles, as they come to know Yahweh and the redemption that is brought through Jesus, now, so much more glory is attainable for God because all men have been brought into redemption with Jesus, to God, through Jesus. And so, for, for several chapters, most of chapter 11 and chapter 9 and 10, Paul is making this argument about how he uses an analogy that we're grafted into a tree. And he says that the Hebrews are like a healthy tree that's been cultivated by God, but there are some in the nation of Israel, they refused to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And Paul uses the analogy, he says that God broke those branches off of the tree because they had willfully rejected God's promise. And he has grafted in the Gentiles into that same tree to share in the fullness of God's promise. He says we all draw strength from the same root system. So I've got to explain 
something here. So we're going to be in chapter 12, but we're also going to look at the last couple of verses of, of verse 11. And the reason why is if, if you look at, at chapter 12, verse 1, the very first word is therefore. Now, I heard this when I was a kid, and it makes sense to me. Anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to understand what it's there for. Okay? You've got to go back. It's kind of a dad joke. But you've got to go back to get context, right? It's like the word because. Such and such and such. Because this. Okay? You can't split it in half and not look at the full context. So we've got to go back to the first couple of verses. So turn back one page to chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 33. So... 2020, as, as I have been praying about the direction of reach and what it means for us, um, this, the word transformation kept coming. And um, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So the first thing I want you to look at, if you're, if you're taking notes, the first thing we're going to look at is the need for transformation. We're going to look at who God is. So starting here in verse 33 in chapter 11, it says this. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. In other words, God's wisdom and knowledge are so deep that we can't understand them. Let me read that again. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and untraceable his ways. We live in a, in a society that is driven by information, right? So, if you don't know something, you're just going to look it up on your phone. I don't know the definition to a word. I don't know how to spell a word, so I'm going to Google it. I do that all the time, right? We live in the information age. But the problem with being a human being is that we're fallible. We are finite. And so for God, he doesn't possess any of those qualities. We live in an age and a generation of people who loves to cast doubt. They love to cast shadows on what is true. You believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Are you sure about that? You believe that the God of the Bible is the only God. Are you sure about that? You believe that there are certain boundaries for the way that we should live our lives. Are you sure about that? Are you sure that you understand what love is? Are you sure that you understand how you're supposed to live a healthy life? I thought everything was about, about uh, being tolerant. I thought everything was about love. I thought everything was about forgiveness. You can't take one piece and forget the whole. It says that God is unsearchable. You can't outsmart him, right? This isn't the matrix. We can't just pop a blue pill and think, think that we've got to figure it out, right? It doesn't work that way. God is completely informed. He continues. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? There's this, uh, there's this idea somehow. This is kind of interesting to me because I've been, I've been studying some of this stuff in seminary about how God is not controlled by time, Right? There, there are some subtle heresies that we believe that we don't necessarily think, we don't really recognize them, right? The first is that somehow God is ignorant about the future. And that somehow my future is in question. So I don't know if you guys have ever gotten this question, but um, it goes something like this. So, Taylor, you're about to graduate. What are you going to do, do with your life? Whatever God wants me to do, I just want to be obedient. Right? It's like this, and this question haunts us. It haunts us. Why am I not at the next step? Why am I not in the magical trajectory of life that everybody seems to think that it works that way? I'm going to graduate high school, and then I'm going to go to college, and then I'm going to meet somebody in college, and then I'm going to get married right after college, and then I'm going to have babies, and I'm going to buy a house, and I'm going to get a car, and I'm going to do all these other things. I'm going to get a job, and I'm going to retire. But nothing about that is true with what God's Word says. We apply these arbitrary terms to our lives, and we expect that everything is going to be fine, but the truth is that we burden ourselves, and we cripple ourselves with these questions. This says, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? In other words, God does not need advisors. Not only does God have complete knowledge, but he doesn't need anybody to help him solve the problem. So when, you, so when you hear that question, what are you going to do with your life? Be like, I have no idea, and I'm cool with that. 
Here's something that most adults will never, never tell you, is that they are making this up as they go. Everyone is in this boat. What are you going to do with your life? I have no clue. I have no idea. I'm in my third career, and I'm almost 35 years old. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm literally making this up every day. Right? I don't know if you have, get some freedom from that, but the truth is, like, I have no clue. I've worked for some really powerful people, and I've worked for some not-so-powerful people. I have cleaned up nasty things, and I have built incredible things. I've walked in the halls of power, and I have walked through slums of third world countries. I have no idea what I'm doing. But I can rest assured that God knows everything, and he doesn't need anybody's advice to help him solve the problem. I can draw strength in that. Look at this next thing in verse 35. It says, Who has ever given to God that he should be repaid? God owes no one anything. It's impossible for him to owe favors. Here's what, so Paul talks about this in another letter. He talks about how um, ours, the things that we bring to God are like filthy rags. Right? So think about this. You got this little kid. You're playing with this little kid outside, right? And you're ma- they're making mud pies. And they bring you a mud pie. Are you going to eat it? No, you're not, right? You're not going to eat the mud pie because it's a freaking mud pie. It's dirt and water. It's nasty, right? You don't know what it's been. Backyard's probably dog poop in it. You're not going to eat it. Think about this. We we take these stuff, all the stuff that we that we offer to God, like, oh, that's great. I'm going to package that up and I'm going to give that to the Lord. Lord, look at my sacrifice. Here it is. It's a mud pie. What, does, what do you tell that little child? Thank you so much for this. This is great. You made this yourself? Thank you. It's a token of, of love, right? God sees the same thing. All the little token things that we say that we're going to give him, these are mud pies. Paul takes it an extra step. He calls them menstrual rags, which is disgusting. Yeah, super nasty. God doesn't owe anybody anything. Check this out in verse 36. He says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. We haven't even gotten to the, to the meat of the text we're going to look at tonight, but check this out. I've got to break this down a little bit. So from him, through him, to him are all things. So in other words, everything comes from God first. Everything, all matter, all talent, all life, everything that you see and know and understand that exists in the world. Okay, so your body, as healthy or as not healthy as it is, is from him. And he has made you on purpose, for a purpose, that way. God doesn't make no junk. He doesn't. It doesn't matter what color your hair is. It doesn't matter how tall you are, how wide you are, how you speak, any of those things. God doesn't make junk. Period. Everything comes from him. He is the source of all life and matter. Also, everything comes through him. What that means is that God is a God of participation. Think about in Genesis 1-1, right? In the beginning, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the deep. And the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. If you read John chapter 1, it says that everything was made through the Word. In other words, Jesus, God in the flesh already, created the world in physical matter in His image. God is a God of participation. See, all the other religions of the world... They, they put their deity way over here. And the rest of creation, all physical matter, is dirty and nasty and cannot touch it. So what happens is, as a human being, according to the other religions of the world, you have to appease the angry God in order for you to be able to enter his presence. But the radical thing about Jesus is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to make the first move. 
he actually stepped out and came over to our side and he said, I want you. So not only does everything come from him and through him, he is present, he is with us, he is participatory, but everything comes to him. That means that God has made all creation with an attraction for holiness. Everything about life, everything about his creation, compels us to the throne of God. And what happens is that is why the most severe judgment for his creation, hell, separation from God, are those who willfully turn away and they reject what he has done to them and through them, and they reject it completely. Because if you go back and you read Romans chapter 1, Paul says this. He says that God's presence is self-evident. He's been revealed in nature. But continually over a lifetime, if you continue to tell God, I don't want conviction, I don't want you in my life, I don't want to live this way, I don't care anything about what you say, and you continually reject the presence of his, of his spirit in your life, he will give you exactly what you ask for. And in Romans chapter 1, it says that he will give you a mind that is free of conviction. I'll do whatever I want. I will be free. I'm not going to feel bad about anything that I do. What a terrible place to be. Because I don't know about you, but some of the, the deepest and darkest places in my life has been when I have had no evidence of God's presence in my life except for the feeling of, of conviction in my heart. That's the only confidence that I had that he was present with me, was conviction in my heart. I knew that what I was doing was wrong. I knew the way that I was living was wrong. And yet, that conviction was knowledge that he, that he was present in my life. So do we need transformation? The truth is that God is God and we are not. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. He is omnipresent. He is all of these things, and I am not. I am a, I am a finite being. We need transformation. Okay, now we get to the therefore. So we know we need transformation, but let's look at the cost of transformation. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, because of all these things, because of God's wisdom and his knowledge and his unsearchable judgment, and he doesn't owe anybody anything that he can't be repaid, he doesn't owe anybody anything, because of those things, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as, living, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Now, he says the word mercies of here. He says, because of the mercies of God. What's interesting here, here is that the Greek word for mercy is ektramos. And it means this, it is the seed of emotions. We would refer to it as the heart today. In modern language, this intro would read, Brothers and sisters, because of what God has done, I urge you to put on his heart. Think about this. We have a lot of, lot of toxic things in our culture. And there are a lot of things that pretend to be Christian. There are a lot of things that pretend to be godly. But those who are of the faith, and even those who aren't, they see the facade and the fakeness that, that are really behind the spirit of these things. These things come across, they say in love, I'm going to call that person out for their sin because they're living a reprobate life. And what happens is they look terrible. There is no love, right? There is no kindness. There is no gentleness. There is no self-control. There is no joy. It's interesting. Paul is saying, because God is all of these things and because we are reflections of him, think about this. In order to accurately interact with our world, you have to put on God's heart. Because of his mercies, because of what he's modeled for us, we are called to put on his mercies, put on his heart. How do we do that? By being a living sacrifice. And here's the other thing. So he, said, he goes on, he says, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, here's the other thing that we, that, we, that we deal with in our culture is that it seems like all religion is intellectual. 
seems like everything is philosophical. It's all private. I don't have to talk about my faith because that's personal to me. That's just my truth. And if you have a truth that's of your own, that's okay. If you knew someone was dying and was sick and they didn't, ha- they, they didn't know what kind of medicine they needed to take and you had access to it and you knew exactly what they needed to be healed, would you give it to them or would you be like, you know what, you're sick, that's just kind of your thing, you do it. Or would you, with the heart of Christ, have compassion and be moved for someone who's dying? He says we are supposed to be living sacrifices. You know the problem with living sacrifices? Is that they're always crawling off the altar. That's our problem. Like, okay, Lord, I'm here. And then five minutes later, I walk away. Right? The thing about chasing Jesus, we say that a lot. The thing about chasing Jesus is that this is an actual thing. This isn't something that we compartmentalize on a Sunday or we compartmentalize on a Tuesday night or a Thursday night or whatever. This is an actual thing. Like this takes physical exertion to be transformed, to have the heart of God. We have to physically act. Consider what Jesus did, right? Did God just say, okay, I'm going to metaphorically send my son and he's going to metaphorically die for your sins. and He's going to metaphorically raise from the dead. It was physical, tangible. People could reach out and they could touch Jesus. There will be a day, if you know Jesus, that you will literally be able to hug his neck. Not metaphorically, not a giant man in the sky with a big white beard. Jesus. He made himself flesh. He humbled himself. I heard a great analogy. Like, how could God be man? How does the the whole thing, like him coming down, like, what does that mean? Consider this, right? So you have a king in a throne room. He's wearing his robe. He's wearing his crown on, right? There's all these people around. And there's a mess on the floor. So the king takes off his robe. He puts his crown down, and he gets on his hands and knees, and he begins to wipe the floor and clean the floor up. Is he still the king? Absolutely. Is he a servant? Absolutely. This is what's so amazing about our God, about the God, the only God, is that he literally took off his robe, this is in Philippians, and he laid it down, all of the, all of the pleasures and priorities of being king, and he got on his hands and knees, and he cleaned the floor. That's what's amazing about this, is that it's physical. This isn't just some metaphorical world that we live in. The drive to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of Christ is not because we owe him anything. Remember, God can't owe us things. But because his presence in our lives compels us to do what, that we become like him. Remember, things are co- that we come to him, from him, toward him. Our faith is not just academic, it's tangible. Remember, he's a God of participation, right? He's always been a God of participation. There has never been a time when God was separate from his people, ever. Ever. But here's the other thing about being a living sacrifice. Look at what it says. I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. This is a pretty common, common verse that a lot of people recognize. So there's two kinds of sacrifices in the Old Testament. The first is for forgiveness of sins, and the second is for worship. Now, the first one about forgiveness of sins has been taken care of through Jesus, right? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, right? Now, the second sacrifice is an offering of praise. So the first one is about making me right, The second one is about me giving up something in return, not because I owe it, but because I gladly give it. See, being a living sacrifice is not something that I wake up in the morning and I'm like, got to do my Jesus time today, all right, he's going to be mad at me if I don't. That's not how this works. 
I get up in the morning because I get to spend time with my Jesus. Because I have found that out of all the other things that I've tried, I've tried to be the smart guy. I've tried to be the good-looking guy. I've tried to be the charming guy. I've tried to have all the answers. I've tried to be the musical guy. I've tried all these things, right? And nothing works. Nothing. Because I am not enough. I do these things. I'm a living sacrifice. I act on my, on my faith. I'm obedient physically. God tells me to go somewhere. I don't just say, go therefore and be filled and be warmed. God bless you. Thoughts and prayers. Just appreciate you guys. Praying for you. Hashtag save Australia. Like, I'm going to go do something. Right? Our God is a God of action. It's not just about this philosophical idea. That, oh, well, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, he's kind of my buddy. You know, we kind of hang out together sometimes. Yeah, I sing songs about him sometimes on Sundays, but I really don't know what that means. So for a lot of you, you've grown up in church, you've been around church a long time, and you know a lot of things about Jesus, but you don't actually know Jesus. Your relationship with Jesus is a lot like your relationship with Abraham Lincoln. You know a lot about him, but you don't know the guy. I mean, let's just be real. When was the last time that you looked back at your life and you said, you know what, because of Jesus, because of what he has done in my life, I am a different person today than I was yesterday or a week ago or a month ago or a year ago or five years ago. Am I a different person? Has there been transformation? We keep crawling off the altar, and we wonder, why is there no transformation in our lives? The truth is that we are not sacrificing anything. We're not. What we do is we say, okay, yeah, Jesus, I'm going to trust you with my life. Thanks for the salvation. I'm going to go do what I want now. That means I'm going to pick the job I want. I'm going to go to the school I want. I'm going to pick the relationship that I want. I'm going to do the stuff that I want. Uh, I'll come and see you on Sundays. Appreciate you. Nothing about that is going to lead to a transformed life. Nothing at all. What it's going to do is you're going to wake up one day and you're going to be 45 years old, 50 years old. You might be married, you might not. You might be divorced, you might not. And you're going to realize, you're going to walk into church on a Sunday morning, you're going to realize, you know what? I really don't like this place. People are fake. They're weird. I just don't want to do this anymore. So you sit through service, you get in your car, and you go home, and that's when you decide, you know what, I really, I really deserved a different life. It happens every day. Every day. Because people live their lives and they chase shadows. Have you ever tried to chase your shadow? Have you ever caught it? No. Because this isn't Peter Pan. You can't do that. Chasing shadows. This, this actually costs us something. If you believe in Jesus, you say you believe in Jesus, and it has cost you nothing so far, you're doing it wrong. I'm telling you right now. And if there's no change in your life, that you're definitely doing it wrong. That's the proof. Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. There are fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, right? But there's also fruits of the flesh. Drunkenness, lewdness, revelries, which means partying. All of these things, right? What's the byproduct of your life? He goes on, he says, holy and pleasing. He says, he says I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Now, Here's the thing. For some of us, if we look at our lives, if we're honest, there is nothing holy and there is nothing pleasing about anything that we do. So you may say, oh yeah, God, I'm all in. Like, God, oh, this, this is what we're doing. I'll do whatever you want. You want me to go to Africa? I'll go to Africa. You want me to go to Australia? Hug baby koalas? I'll do it. But there's nothing holy and pleasing about your life whatsoever. 
Because who you are is determined by how you spend the quiet moments of your life, right? How are you, how are you investing your spirit? Are you being changed? Are you actually bought in enough to where tomorrow you're different than you were yesterday? Have you believed Jesus enough? Have you been obedient enough radically that when you look back, people say, you know what, that person is really odd, but I cannot explain why things work out for them. Every single time. It's so weird. Why is that person successful? Why do they do those things? He says, this is our, the, this is our worship. It's a logical result for a life that's, that has put on God's heart. Remember, everything is to him. I read this this week. It really is, is um, put this in context for me. There's a misconception that, that this is all free, so why do I have to change? But the truth is that God's grace is free, but it's not cheap. God's grace is free, but it is not cheap. You don't pick it up at Dollar Tree. It is priceless. And what we do is every morning we wake up, and that thought that's in your head, you know what, I probably should get up, but I can catch another 30 minutes of sleep. I'll do my quiet time when I get home from work. Or I'll do my quiet time, I'll spend time with Jesus when I get off from school. Or what I'm doing, whatever. Does that usually happen? No, it doesn't. Cheap grace is different than free grace. Just because something is given to you for free doesn't change its value. The last thing I want you to see is the result of transformation. Look at verse 2. So because we're living sacrifice, because we stay on the altar, because we put our, the heart of God on, and we have presented ourselves holy and pleasing to God in true worship. Look at what he says. He says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. He says, don't be conformed. Don't be pressed into the mold of the world. See, what happens is we, when we're living, there's naturally difficulty that comes, right? And that difficulty is going to press you into the mold of whatever you put around yourself. Okay? So if you put around yourself shallow people who don't take spiritual things seriously, if you surrounded yourself with a community that doesn't value godly things, if you have surrounded yourself with a culture that is driven by, by lust and physical attraction, if you've surrounded yourself by a culture that is driven by alcohol and addiction and substance abuses, what happens to you when life presses on you is it presses you into the mold of the world. And over time, you harden. You harden in that place. And then guess what? After you've been pressed into a mold, after you have been cast, now you can be used to make other molds. See, we have this misconception that the things that I do, the decisions that I make, they only affect me. This is a radical truth in our day and age. What you do matters. Who you decide to be in the quiet moments of your life matters. The self-talk that you have matters. The things that, that, that go into your brain, the things that you feel, they matter. Satan wants to press you into the mold. He wants you to surround you by people. That's his model. He surrounds you by people. He uses the stress of life to push you into those molds to make you what he wants you to be. Which is not what God wants you to be. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but, but, but be renewed. The act of complete abandonment, of being a living sacrifice to God in a worshipful response to his redemption, changes us. Paul is saying that we don't trade a pitiful, unchanged life. If we don't do that, we trade it. We trade that cheap thing for the metamorphosis that comes through having a true heart of God. He says, don't be conformed. This is cheap. Be transformed. Apply yourself 
But how are we transformed? We transform ourselves by being a physical, living sacrifice, living out this faith. Not intellectually, not some idea, not some philosophical lifestyle, not private. This is, this is roll, your, roll your sleeves up, dirty hands, doing real life with people, being humble with people, and being sincere. Chasing Jesus is not, a, not a, a, an idea that is separate from reality. It's a contact sport. You can't get around it. And here's the thing that's amazing, is that the more you're transformed, the more people are drawn to you. I don't know if you guys know anybody in your lives that you're like, you know, I don't know what it is, but that person, I really, I, I think I just need to spend some time with that person. You know? The reason why is that that person's chasing Jesus. If they have to sell themselves on why you should hang out with them, chances are they're probably not worth hanging out with. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is radical. It's a natural response to what God has done. Here's the thing. Look at the last part of this verse, in verse 2. He says, Don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. I get this question all the time. What is God's will for my life? What's God's will? I have no idea. What am I supposed to do? I have no idea. The solution is right here in verse 1. How do you know the will of God? Urge, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed. You will not know the will of God if you are not living a transformed life. It is not possible. Here's what happens. We say, God, tell me your will. Show me your will. And then we put earplugs in and we put a blindfold on. And we say, God, I can't hear you. I need to know your will. I've got a deadline. I'm supposed to get married next decade. I'm supposed to have a job. I'm supposed to have a family. I'm supposed to have a car. I'm supposed to have all these. I need, to tell, I need you to tell me what, what your will is. I'm really getting nervous down here. Living sacrifices crawl off of the altar. It takes a conscious decision every day to be a living sacrifice. And you know what? Some days it really sucks. And some days it's awesome. The awesome days far outweigh the sucky days. I'll tell you that. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 16. He says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me and let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? The cost is everything. The cost of a transformed life is everything. Why does this matter? Why does any of this matter? Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to wake up 10 years from now or when I'm an old man and look back and realize that I've wasted everything, that I've chased shadows. I want to grow. I want to be a different person. I want to taste and see that the Lord is good, Psalm 34. Psalm 37, I want to trust in the Lord and I want to do good and I want to feed on his faithfulness. I want to delight in him because in delighting in him, he will give me the desires of my heart. So what does this mean for us, for REACH? Where are we going this next year? If true transformation comes from being a living sacrifice and being present, actively being obedient to what God has us to do, this is what I see for us over the next few years as REACH. As living sacrifice, si- sacrifices. I see REACH being a community that cares about our city and takes service seriously. i like for us to go with the Kaufmans to the A to B ministry and give food to people who are homeless and to prostitutes in North Tulsa. I want to do that this year. I want to go love on people. I see us being a, 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 a foundational piece of evergreen mission work in the U.S. and around the world. Last year, Laura and I got a chance to go to Nicaragua. I want to challenge you guys. Go with us. 
Go with the Nicaragua team. I'm going back. I'm going to take a small team of construction guys with me too. We're going to, so we do a medical clinic. People come to get seen by a doctor. They get medicine. They hear the gospel. And we've started a five-year partnership with churches in the region. And we're going to go back for the next five years. We're going to love on these people. We're going to do real things. We're going to build stuff for them. We're going to help them, teach them, train them in God's word. We're going to be working with pastors. We're going to be working with churches. People that have nothing. We're going to be painting walls and cleaning things. We're going to be uh, helping children. We're going to be feeding people who have not had a good meal in, in weeks, in months. I see reach. I see this community, young adults, as being hungry to serve. And that's not just here. I think that's elsewhere. I think that's around the world. We have two people, two reachers right now, one overseas and one about to go back. I would love for us to pool resources together and help support them financially. I'd love for us to pool together. We, I mean, we could come up with 100 bucks a month between all of us, right? Five bucks a piece. We can do that. We can actively put our fingerprints in other continents from right here. Imagine that. Imagine if God calls you to go somewhere or to do something, and you have a group of people that are like, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Living sacrifices. I'm in. I see us being a people who take prayer and sacrifice, sacrificial life seriously. This year, I'm going to challenge the, all of us reachers for one month to set aside lunch on one day of the week. And we're not going to eat. We're going to fast and we're going to pray for each other. And we're going to share it on our group meeting and we're going to talk about it and we're going to pray for each other. Fasting Tuesdays or Wednesdays or whatever. I want us to be people who are serious about sacrificial, radical living. I want us to prepare for our own mission trip, not attached to anybody else, but going on our own mission trip in 2021. I want us to go somewhere, whether either here in the U.S. or go somewhere overseas. All I know is that God wants us to go, and I think we should go. I see us doing great things. I see us being serious Bible scholars who are dedicated to teaching our generation to understand and crave the truth of God's word. We live in a post-truth culture. Nobody believes that truth is truth. The problem is that there are absolutes. You are absolutely a sinner. You are absolutely in need of redemption. You are absolutely in need of being transformed. So let's go do it. Let's go talk to people. Let's spread God's word. If you haven't served, if you can't go to Nicaragua, I would challenge you, get involved with AJ in the youth ministry as a leader, as a mentor. Many of you do that already. Go with AJ to Latvia. Yeet, yeet, right? Do something. Be a living sacrifice. Do something incredible. I see us being dedicated to worship and the art of bringing our praise to the Lord in every way that we're gifted, either through music or through service. Not everybody can play an instrument. Not everybody can sing, and that's fine. Because God's equipped all of us individually to do something different. I want us to learn how to worship God and how we're equipped. If that means taking somebody's blood pressure or giving them a shot or whatever, then you do that. This is who we are. If we would just do it. I see us being dedicated to the discipline of making disciples through intentional one-on-one relationships. Here's the thing, and I'll close with this. This year is the year of transformation. This group of people, your generation, my generation, we have the opportunity. We are not the future of the church. We are the church. And the only way that we're going to understand and know the will of God is if we are living sacrifices. If we lay it on the line and we say, you know what? Forget this. I don't don't care what the world says about me. I don't care what my friends say about me. I had somebody block me on Instagram the other day because I I post too much Jesus stuff. I was like, okay, cool. Well, whatever. Bye, Felicia. Right? I'm not, seriously, guys, like, let's do something that will change not just the world, but change us. I don't know about you, but on January the 7th, 2021, I want to look back at 2020 and be like, you know what? That was freaking awesome. I want to do more. I want to do bigger things. I want to go on that mission trip. I couldn't go this year, but I want to go next year. I want to know those people. 
We've talked about other things. We've talked about going to Passion, the Passion Conference, in the next couple of years. We've talked about taking a ski trip, right? Spending time together, being intentional about that. Doing things together, making this a priority. Because here's the thing, the world loves to separate people, isolate people. We have to make a conscious effort to fight that. That's why getting together like this is so important. And Taylor says this all the time, like, if I didn't come to reach, I'd just sit at home and wonder what I'm doing. Like, be alone in my loneliness, being alone. Right? I want to encourage you. This next year is the year of transformation. And the only way that we're going to be transformed and to know the will of God is if we radically throw ourselves on the altar. I told some of our girls this morning at breakfast, I said, I want to be militantly dedicated to attacking our fear. I want to do big things. And if I'm the only one that's, that wants to do it, that's fine. But what God's word says is the only way that I'm going to live a transformed life, the only way that I'm going to change, the only way that I'm going to know God's will, and the only way that I'm going to be a holy and pleasing sacrifice is if I lay myself completely on the altar. Total abandonment, absolute trust. Swing for the fences, close your eyes, and see what happens. God, I want you to call me to get out of the boat. Jesus, if that's you, tell me to get out of the boat. Let me do something dangerous. This year the year of transformation is going to be a year of dangerous stuff. And it's going to be awesome. The altar is not a peaceful place. For a living sacrifice on the altar is a very dangerous, thrilling, transforming place to be. Let this year be the year of transformation, the year that we finally say, you know what? I've kind of been nibbling around the edges, and I'm going to dive in. I'm here for you. I'm rooting for you. God is with you. He is a participant in this. We're not on our own. Who we are next year is going to be decided by who we decide to be today. Will you join me in doing that? What's up, everybody? This is Philip Jackson, pastor of Young Adults at Evergreen Church in South Tulsa. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday night at Evergreen Church. Doors open at 6.30, services at 7, at the corner of 111th and Mingo. Be sure and check us out online at reachtulsa.org, or you can find us on social media on Instagram at reach.tulsa. Also, don't forget to subscribe. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Bring your glory down. Come fill your 